Assalamu alaikum. So in this lecture, what we will be doing is uh, we'll be talking about two other proteins, and these are myoglobin and hemoglobin as examples of globular proteins. So um, before we proceed into the structures of these two proteins, let me tell you what the functions of the proteins are. The main function of myoglobin is to store oxygen in muscles. So basically, when it, in cases of hypoxia, that is when oxygen pressure is very, very low in muscles, then myoglobin releases oxygen. Now the oxygen-bound protein is known as oxymyoglobin, and the oxygen-free protein is known as deoxymyoglobin. Hemoglobin, on the other hand, functions mainly in transporting gases, mainly, of course, oxygen from lung to peripheral tissues, and on the way back, it carries CO2 to lungs, and then it gets exhaled. Now, hemoglobin also functions in blood buffering, be being a very dominant protein in blood, it can maintain a blood pH by absorbing or binding to and releasing protons. Now these two proteins, myoglobin and hemoglobin, are holoproteins. I'm sure that Dr. Diana defined what holoproteins are, but basically let me define it again. So a holoprotein is a protein that has a non-protein group bound to it. Okay? Now if this non-protein group is removed, then the protein is known as an apoprotein. Example um, includes uh, lipoproteins. Now, uh, in, in the lipid lectures, I'm sure you also covered lipoproteins. So, lipoproteins are proteins that are associated with lipids and they are carriers of lipids uh, in, in our system. If we remove the lipid part, then the proteins are known as apolipoproteins. Okay? So, <coughs> myoglobin and hemoglobin are holoproteins. Specifically, they belong to a large group of proteins known as hemoproteins because they have a heme group associated with them. Now, this heme group is an organic molecule, and we'll talk about it in the next slide. Now, these hemoproteins belong to a large number of proteins again. You have electron uh, carriers in the electron transport chain. Uh, we'll talk about these in uh, next semester in the metabolism lecture. Um, uh, we also have um, sensor proteins, um, heme sensors, for example, gas sensors, and so on. And you have enzymes like the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Now, the heme group is also known as a prosthetic group. And a prosthetic group, basically, is a group, a non-protein group, that is bound tightly, or, in other words, covalently, to a protein. Now, this prosthetic group can be organic, like vitamins, sugars, lipids, heme, as an example. Or they can be inorganic, such as metals, okay? But they're not composed of amino acids, and they are tightly bound, again, covalently bound. Now, this is the heme molecule. Basically, that's the heme molecule right here. It's basically, uh, the precursor of heme is a molecule known as protoporphyrin-9 except that it is associated with iron. And this iron is in the uh, uh, ferrous state. Now the heme molecule is composed of four pyrrole rings. This is a pyrrole ring. So rings have names, like for example, um, the imidazole ring in histidine, the benzene ring, for example. Uh, another example is the indole ring of tryptophan. So you have four rings and they're known as A, B, C, D. They're designated as A, B, C, and D. Right in the center you have iron 
and iron is bound covalently to the four rings um, having four covalent bonds. Now, also associated with or what characterizes heme is the presence of side chains. These are the methyl group, a vinyl group, and you have the propionate group. Note that the propionate group is negatively charged. But overall, the heme molecule is hydrophobic and it is planar. That is, it is flat. Now, something else about iron is that it can form six covalent bonds. Four of them are with the pyrrol rings. So you have two left. So let's move on and talk about myoglobin. So myoglobin is a monomeric protein, meaning that it is composed of just one single polypeptide chain. Now, in the center, you have heme bound to it. And what characterizes myoglobin is that it is composed of eight alpha helices, and these are designated from A to H. So you have A, starting with the N terminus right here. You have the A alpha helix. Then you have the B alpha helix. Then you have the C, D, and so on, all the way to H between the alpha helices you have turns so you have another secondary structure but mainly it is composed of uh, uh, helical regions or domains now just like any other globular protein you have on the surface of the protein the mainly polar and charged amino acids right in the center of the molecule you have the hydrophobic amino acids but there are two exceptions that is and these are known and these are histidine residues there are two histidine residues and these histidine residues they are hydrophilic but they exist in the center in the core of the molecule and these two histidine residues are known as the proximal histidine and the distal histidine. So you have the proximal histidine in the F alpha helix and you have the distal histidine in the E alpha helix. Now whenever you notice that there are hydrophilic amino acids in the center of the molecule it gives you an indication that these amino acids have a purpose and the purpose of the proximal histidine since it's the closer closer one to the heme is it binds to iron so this is the fifth coordinate this is the fifth covalent bond that iron can form remember you have four with the heme and here you have the fifth one okay now so again there's this is another view so you have the proximal histidine in the F helix uh, forming a covalent bond with the iron and you have the uh, the distal histidine in the E helix and it's very close it's it it lies on the other side of the um, proximal histidine okay and it overlooks iron and the sixth coordinate that iron can form the sixth covalent bond that iron form is with the oxygen molecule so notice the uh, close distance between the uh, distal histidine with the oxygen that is bound to him. Now, something about the position of the heme molecule is that, remember I said that you have the propionate groups, these are the negatively charged groups. Now these two groups, are ex uh, they extend to the outside, they interact with the hydrophilic polar charged amino acids on the surface 
of the molecule. But the rest of the molecule lies inside the, the protein in what we know as the hydrophobic pocket. Now, something about um, the distalicidine is that uh, it lies, as I said, on the other side of the heme molecule, on the other side of the proximal histidine, and it overlooks uh, the the organ the position where oxygen binds to. Now the thing is, is that what the distalicidine does is that it can form hydrogen bonding with the oxygen. So what it does is that it stabilizes the interaction between uh, oxygen with the heme molecule. Okay, so remember that. This is purpose number one of the distal histidine. So as I said, you have iron in the ferrous state. It can form four covenant bonds, four with the uh, with the uh, pyrrole rings, and you have one with the proximal histidine and the sixth one with the oxygen itself. Now, something important about iron is that it has to be in the ferrous state in order to bind oxygen. If it becomes in the ferric state, if it gets oxidized, then iron cannot bind to oxygen anymore. Something else is that the heme molecule gives blood the uh, distinct red color that we know. Okay, so these lectures um, are concerned with knowing the relationship between structure and function. In other words, the purpose of amino acids. Now, what's important about, about is that the heme molecule is a hydrophobic molecule, so it fits in the hydrophobic pocket. Okay, so so the hydrophobic amino acids that surround the heme molecule stabilize the interaction between heme with the protein. Something else is that the heme molecule itself supports the structure of the myoglobin protein by forming these covalent bonds with the well, the covalent bond with the uh, proximal histidine and stabilizing the hydrophobic amino acids that surround it. So it is a win-win situation. Remember how I said that the distal histidine stabilizes oxygen interaction with with uh, with oxygen, oxygen interaction with iron. Something else is that is that distal histidine or functions as a gatekeeper. So it allows for oxygen to get in, and it prevents other molecules from getting in as well. So there is preference for oxygen entry into the hydrophobic pocket. Something else that is important about the hydrophobic amino acids that surround the heme molecule is that they prevent the oxidation of iron when oxygen is released. So usually what happens when oxygen is released, the molecule, like iron, becomes oxidized. But because this iron is surrounded by hydrophobic amino acids, it does not get oxidized. And remember, I said that in order for iron to bind oxygen, it has to be in the ferrous state. It should not be oxidized. Now, there is something else about this histidine, and that is binding to carbon monoxide. If you have a free heme molecule and you add carbon monoxide and oxygen to that heme molecule, carbon monoxide has much, much, much higher affinity towards heme. So it has 
many orders of magnitude. That is, we're talking about a, a logarithmic scale. We're talking about like a thousand or ten thousand times higher affinity for carbon monoxide than oxygen. Now, what happens is that, and and usually carbon monoxide, by the way, binds to molecules and it it, it likes to be kept in a straight position. But what happens is that because heme is part of the myoglobin molecule and because you, it overlooks the histidine, the distal histidine, there is repulsion that is created between carbon monoxide and the distal histidine. So carbon monoxide binds at an angle which is not preferred at all by carbon monoxide. So that weakens the affinity of carbon monoxide to the heme molecule. So instead of thousands of uh, of, of uh, thousands of orders of magnitude relative to oxygen, ox carbon monoxide has only 250 times more affinity or higher affinity than oxygen. So why is it that uh, we don't die? Because the level of carbon monoxide in our body is very low. So oxygen wins the competition. In fact, in our body, carbon monoxide occupies only 1% of hemoglobin. Okay? But if this hysterine does not exist, then it, it would occupy 99% of hemoglobin. It wins the competition. Now, something about oxygen is that it likes, it prefers its interaction with iron to be at an angle. So, uh, so there is a, 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 a high affinity, good affinity, of oxygen towards binding to him. Remember this hydrogen bonding between the distalicidine and oxygen as well. Now, let's connect biochemistry to real life. Now the thing is, we hear a lot in, jo in Jordan about um, cases of death as a result of heaters. Now what happens with these heaters is that they produce a lot of carbon monoxide. So when people um, stay or sleep overnight with heaters on, um, they get poisoned as a result of the carbon monoxide that is produced by these heaters. Now it's also a case in the United States, for example, <coughs> where people keep their cars in garages, especially in the winter. So they wake up in the morning and they turn on their cars um, to get them warm, okay, so that they would get uh, to work. Now cars produce carbon monoxide and the garages usually are closed. So when they, after, after turning on the, their cars for uh, for some time, like 10, 15 minutes, and they get into the garage, there are cases where they get poisoned as a result of this carbon monoxide that is produced uh, by these cars, and it exists at very high levels in these closed garages. I'm not giving you ideas, but it's very common that people who want to commit suicide, they, co they connect a hose from the exhaust to inside the car and they close it, they close the car and they sit in their car waiting to die. Again, I'm not giving you ideas and don't do this before the biochemistry exam. Okay, so I said that the purpose of uh, the function of myoglobin is to bind to oxygen and to release it in case in cases of emergency that is hypoxia so you would expect so if i tell you how would you expect oxygen binding to myoglobin to be would you expect it to be at high affinity or low affinity now your answer should be it should be at high affinity 
so that it does not get released unless the pressure of oxygen, the amount of oxygen in tissues is very, very low. And that is exactly the case. So this is known as the oxygen saturation curve. So in the x-axis, you have the amount of oxygen in tors or millimeter of mercury. Um, now remember, it's gas, so it's, it's uh, measured um, as pressure, not concentration. And in the y-axis, you have the fraction of uh, saturation, that is, the fraction of myoglobin uh, molecules that, are that is bound to uh, oxygen. So 0%, 50%, and 100%. Now, look at the oxygen saturation curve. It looks hyperbolic. So the shape of the plot is known as hyperbolic. Okay? Now, what it means, and if you look at it, um, notice that, that uh, almost 100% of myoglobin is saturated when you have only 25 tors of oxygen in tissues okay now there is something in biochemistry as well as pharmacology and toxicology and that is the 50% mark the 50% mark gives you an idea about uh, things like affinity of binding what we mean by affinity is strength of interaction how strong two molecules interact or bind to each other. Now the 50% mark gives you an idea about the affinity. So the idea is, what is the P50? That is, what is the pressure of oxygen where 50% of myoglobin is saturated or bound to oxygen? And so you look at the 50% mark, you go here, you go down, and you look at the x-axis and you say it's to tor. So the idea here is that if I ask you what is the P50, what is the uh, 50, what is the pressure of oxygen where 50% of myoglobin is bound to oxygen, you say it is to tor the pressure of oxygen that is needed to fill 50% or to saturate 50% of myoglobin molecules is 2 tor. And this is very low, meaning that the affinity is high. In other words, you need very little oxygen to saturate 50% of the myoglobin molecule. So you need very little, meaning that uh, the affinity is high. I hope that this is clear. Now, so let's talk about hemoglobin right now. Hemoglobin is different than myoglobin in function. That is, the main function of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen from lungs to peripheral tissues. Remember that. So myoglobin is a monomeric protein, but hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein because it is composed of four polypeptide chains bound to each other. Okay. Now, the other thing is that the four chains belong to two types. And these are known as the alpha globin chain and the beta globin chain or polypeptide. So you have two of each. So the hemoglobin molecule is known as an alpha 2 beta 2 protein because it has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Now these are these alpha and beta by the way these are designations so for other proteins they all can also be composed of alpha and beta and gamma chains 
but they are different than the alpha and beta of the hemoglobin molecule. So these are just designations. So you have two beta chains that you see in here in, in blue and in orange you have the two alpha chains. Now each one of these chains contain a heme molecule. So you have four heme molecules per chain, per, per polypeptide chain. Now something else about the alpha and beta chains is that they are also composed of many alpha helices. The alpha chain is composed of seven alpha helices and the beta chain is composed of eight alpha helices. And these helices are also designated as A, B, C, D, etc. So all the way to H for the, the, the beta chain and um, and uh, F, uh, I'm sorry, G in case of the alpha chain. Now something else is that the alpha chain is composed of 141 amino acid residues, but the beta chain is composed of 146 residues. Remember this 146 number right here. Now, something else is that the beta chain the beta globin chain is, is similar in structure to the myoglobin molecule. So there is a good similarity in structure between the myoglobin molecule and the beta globin polypeptide chain. So how are these uh, subunits connected to each other? How are these polypeptide uh, chains connected to each other? Basically, a hemoglobin molecule is a dimer of dimers. So what you have is an alpha-beta dimer interacting with another alpha-beta dimer. Now, the alpha and beta polypeptide chains within this dimer are linked to each other via hydrophobic interactions. So you have hydrophobic interactions between these two alpha and beta and you have hydrophobic interactions between these two alpha and beta but these two dimers interact with each other via hydrogen bonds and electrostatic interactions okay so can you have hydrophobic or nonpolar amino acids on the surface of molecules and the answer is yes you can have them and usually they have a purpose and the purpose in this case is to have these uh, 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 chains polypeptide chains interact with each other now, so let's relate structure to function the idea is that the purpose of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen from lungs to uh, tissues and then it carries CO2 back from tissues to lungs. Now the thing is the pressure of oxygen in lungs is about 100 millimeter of mercury or 100 torr. On the other hand the amount of oxygen or oxygen pressure in, uh, in in tissues is about 40 and it can go down to 30 tor. Now the question is should hemoglobin have very high affinity for oxygen or very low affinity for oxygen? Now the thing is, if it has high affinity for oxygen, then it would bind very efficiently in lungs, it would bind very efficiently to oxygen in lungs, but then when it goes to tissues because it has high affinity, it cannot release this oxygen very efficiently. On the other hand, if hemoglobin has low affinity for oxygen, then 
it would not be saturated in lungs so when it goes to tissues there is hardly any oxygen to be released so insufficient oxygen is released now the answer is hemoglobin has both characteristics it has high affinity and low affinity uh, state for oxygen how is that possible well if we look at the oxygen saturation curve for hemoglobin it looks what we call sigmoidal sigmoidal okay so this is hyperbolic for myoglobin and sigmoidal for hemoglobin so it looks like an s the letter s now what a sigmoidal plot means is that the protein has two states or two structures at low oxygen pressure it has a low affinity state at high oxygen pressure it has a high affinity state and that makes sense so now in lungs where the oxygen pressure is high hemoglobin binds very efficiently to oxygen because it has high affinity but at low pressure when hemoglobin reaches tissues it has low affinity towards oxygen and oxygen is released very smart okay. and it turns out that the p50 of hemoglobin towards oxygen is about 26 tor or millimeter of mercury so it's around here but the pressure in tissues is higher by the way it's about 30 to 40 so how is it possible that hemoglobin has two affinity states high affinity state and a low affinity state and the answer is because hemoglobin has two structures so these are the two structures so hemoglobin switches between a structure that we that is known as a T state and a structure that is known as the R state okay now this little shift is has huge impact on the function of hemoglobin now because hemoglobin has two structural states we call hemoglobin an allosteric protein or an allosteric molecule now allo means different or other steric comes from stereo which means shape or structure so if I say that hemoglobin is an allosteric protein it means that hemoglobin is a protein that has different structures now these two structures again are known as the T state and the R state T stands for tout or tense or tight meaning that the molecule is not uh, uh, and, and this is the state where hemoglobin has low affinity for oxygen now the other state is known as the R state and R stands for relaxed so the molecule in the R state has very high affinity about 500 times higher affinity to oxygen than than if it is in the T state so when the molecule is relaxed it can bind to oxygen with high affinity but if it is tight or in the T state then it has low affinity for oxygen so what happens is that in lungs hemoglobin presumes the R state the R structure the high affinity structure and when it reaches tissues it switches to the T state or the low affinity state 
and oxygen is released. So let's look here um, at the oxygen saturation curve. At low pressure, hemoglobin is in the T state. It has low affinity to oxygen. At high pressure, now hemoglobin is in the R state and it has high affinity to oxygen. Okay. Now, notice the change between the deoxy and the oxy is really very little. What you see is a shift by 15 degrees only. This shift is what makes hemoglobin having a, a high affinity towards oxygen. So what we're going to do now is zoom into the structure of hemoglobin to see how the switch takes place. And I hope that you will appreciate biochemistry at this point. See, what happens is that um, when hemoglobin is not bound to oxygen, the heme molecule has a dome-like structure. So it looks like a dome. Okay, it's not straight. You can see it here as well. So what happens now? This is the the uh, proximal histidine. Right below, you have the uh, distal histidine. So what happens is oxygen comes in, it binds to iron, and what it does is that it pulls the uh, the heme. It makes it straight and it pulls the histidine along with it. So this histidine, the proximal histidine is pulled down. So again, you see oxygen bound to iron. Now heme looks flatter. It doesn't have this bent structure anymore. And you have this histidine pulled uh, uh, away, further away from the helix. Now, what happens then is that you have everything changing. You have this movement of the helix, and this movement of the helix results in, in changing the tertiary structure of this polypeptide, and that changes the whole structure of the molecule. So you have basically change in the structure of the heme molecule that changes the secondary structure, the alpha helix, that uh, contains the proximal histidine that changes the tertiary structure of the polypeptide that is bound to oxygen right now and that changes the electrostatic uh, sorry and that changes the quaternary structure of the whole molecule so changing secondary then tertiary then quaternary structures of the hemoglobin molecule exactly what happens is that you have breakage of the electrostatic interactions between the chains. Remember how we said that the dimers, the two dimers, interact with each other via electrostatic interactions. So what happens is that you have breakage of these electrostatic interactions and the molecule becomes relaxed. So you have less interactions among the different amino acids and the molecule becomes relaxed in the R state and it, it changes to the higher affinity state. Okay, so again, heme is bent, oxygen binds, heme becomes straight, it pulls the uh, proximal histidine uh, further away from the helix that it's bound to that changes the structure of this the secondary structure of this alpha helix and that changes the structure of the whole molecule by breaking these electrostatic interactions another view the electrostatic interactions are reduced in number and the molecule becomes relaxed so you can take a moment to uh, read the text in this figure. Now, something else, and remember that. Whenever you see 
a sigmoidal curve. It means that binding is cooperative. Okay, it means that one, there is change in the structure of the molecule, that's one. Two, it means that there is cooperativity as well. What we mean by cooperativity is that binding of the first oxygen molecule to hemoglobin makes it easier for the second oxygen molecule to bind to the second site. And that makes it even easier for the third oxygen molecule to bind to the third binding site, to the third heme. And that makes it even easier for the fourth oxygen to bind to the hemoglobin molecule, to the heme, that is. Okay? So that exactly what we mean by cooperativity. Okay? So... So we said that hemoglobin is an allosteric protein, meaning that it has different shapes, the high affinity state or structure and the low affinity state or structure. Now, these allosteric proteins, and later on we will be talking about allosteric enzymes as well, these allosteric proteins are regulated by molecules known, small molecules known as allosteric regulators or effectors. Now these allosteric effectors or regulators can either be homotropic or heterotropic. Homo means the same, hetero means different. So if the regulator is the same as the ligand, ligand is a small molecule that binds to a protein or to a uh, receptor for example. Okay. So if the effector, if the regulator and the ligand are the same, then we say that this is a homotropic regulator. So what happens in case of hemoglobin is that oxygen plays the role of a regulator. It stimulates, it induces, it makes it easier for a second oxygen molecule to bind. So it is the same, the effector is the same as the ligand, and we say that this is a homotropic allosteric regulator. Now next lecture, we'll be talking about other regulators, like protons, this phosphorylase rate, and so on. And these regulators, what they do is that they bind to hemoglobin, and they do change the affinity of hemoglobin, of hemoglobin towards oxygen. So the regulators are different than the ligand, the protons, the bisphosphoglycerate, rate, the CO2, and so on. They are different than the ligand, which is oxygen. And these are called as heterotropic allosteric regulators. Now, these regulators, by the way, can have a positive effect or a negative effect. In other words, if we say it has a positive effect, it means that when it binds to the molecule, it makes binding of the ligand easier, or it increases the affinity. That is, affinity means strength of binding or interaction. If it has the opposite effect, that is, if binding of, a, of an effector makes it harder for the ligand to bind to the protein, then we say that it is a negative allosteric effector or regulator. And you can see this uh, in, in this image or picture right here. So I have a protein, it binds to a negative allosteric regulator. It makes it uh, hard for the ligand to bind to the protein. Okay, now you can also have a positive allosteric regulator that can bind to a protein and it makes it easier for a ligand to bind. So this is a positive allosteric regulator. This is a negative allosteric regulator. And both of them are heterotropic allosteric regulators. Now, the, in case of homotropic allosteric, you have binding of a ligand or an effector, 
inf it influences, it induces, stimulates, it makes it easier for a second ligand to bind. In case of, of hemoglobin, it makes it easier for the for binding of two, makes it easier for a third one to bind, binding of three makes it easier for the fourth one to bind. And that's cooperative um, regulation.